Hello everyone and welcome to today's webcast. My name is Ben Frost. I'm the Public Information Officer for APA's Northern New England chapter and one of the coordinators of the Planning Webcast series. This series is brought to you by a consortium of over 40 of APA's chapters and divisions. The consortium itself is not affiliated with APA but rather is a loose-knit association whose mission is to provide high-quality free webinars on topics important to planners that will also help them to meet their certification maintenance requirements. Today is uh, September 23rd, 2016, and you're going to see the um, uh, presentation Measuring Sustainability Outcomes. Easier said than done. For help during today's webcast, you can type a question in to me in the question box uh, on your GoToWebinar screen, or call the 1-800 number shown here, 1-800-263-6317, for real difficult technical support uh, where I probably are una am unable to help you. For content-related questions, uh, type those into the question box uh, located in the webinar toolbar. We'll answer those as time allows at the end of the presentation. Now on your screen is a list of the current sponsoring chapters and division. I want to take a moment to thank them all for making these webcasts possible. Thanks, chapters and divisions. Today's webcast is brought to us by the New York Upstate Chapter of the American Planning Association. Here's a list of a few upcoming webinars. Uh, this is the um, uh, list that's available on the ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast webpage, which is our official site. And thanks to uh, APA's Ohio uh, Chapter for, for hosting that and for doing so much of the back office support. Uh, for this series. Uh, we do, I do want to note that we do have a topic set for uh, next Friday, the 30th of September, and it is on hazard mitigation. Uh, so tune into that. Go to the Ohio Chapter website for more details uh, and also contact your chapter or division representative for any information that I may have sent to them yesterday. To log your CM credits, just log in as you would to your um, your uh, APA account on planning.org, log into my APA account. You can search for this under by searching for CM activities in the CM log. Uh, in the search bar, you can type in the event number, which is 9110603, or the title of today's webcast. You can also search by the provider, um, which is the New York Upstate chapter of APA. All of this information can be found on the ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast webpage. You can like us on Facebook, and that is a good way to get the most up-to-date information on the upcoming webinars. We are recording this webcast, and our uh, recordings are all posted to our YouTube channel, and you can search by logging into YouTube and searching for Planning Webcast, and you'll see everything we have recorded over the past many years, um, including some that are available for distance education. PDFs of presentations are generally available at the ohioplanning.org planning webcast webpage. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Kim Lundgren, who is going to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Ben, and happy Friday, everybody. We are uh, really excited that you're able to join us today. Um, this is an exciting topic, measuring sustainability outcomes, easier said than done. Um, just a quick intro of myself for those of you who don't know me. Uh, as Ben said, my name is Kim Lundgren. I've actually been working with local governments on designing, securing funding for, and implementing sustainability programs related to climate mitigation and adaptation for 15 years. I started doing this as one of the early municipal sustainability directors, then went on to work at ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability. Uh, and then did a few years in the private consulting world, and, and just now I'm about to have two years uh, with my own firm, Kim Lundgren Associates, where we deliver strategic planning and advisory services and sustainability dashboard solutions to local government clients. So I'm really thrilled to be the moderator here today. Um, we really have a very timely webinar for you uh, with some great speakers that will give you an in-depth look at how to collect and use indicators to track and promote your sustainability efforts. Um, we're going to go through all of our presentations and then we'll leave about 10 minutes or so at the end for your Q&A. And as Ben mentioned, you can be putting your questions into the uh, box on the right uh, of the webinar tool uh, as we're going through and he'll be collecting those and we'll um, take those questions at the end. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, George Holmesy. 
George is an assistant professor in the Department of Public Administration at Binghamton University and one of the program directors of the new master's degree in sustainable communities. He researches the factors that shape sustainability programs and planning policies at the municipal level. In particular, he examines the ways that small to medium-sized cities and towns balance the environmental, economic, and equity dimensions of sustainability. George also explores the nexus of heritage and sustainability, especially at the neighborhood level. Uh, prior to that, George was a planning consultant helping local governments across New York State and Western Mass create sustainable communities. George, you want to take it over? Yes, thank you very much. I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, what I'm going to talk today about is uh, I'm going to give some background on po understanding policy evaluation from a you know more a little bit a couple of slides in a little more theoretical sense, the different uh, aspects of it, and then I want to give the results of some of the sur of a survey that we did on sustainability. Um, if I, I've presented some of the results before in terms of a. Uh, uh, at, during a webinar, but I haven't presented these results yet. These were from the same survey that I presented before, but these were actually about measuring outcomes. And uh, partway through my presentation, um, we're going to ask you to um, to run uh, to. We're going to ask you your uh, for your input on what kinds of things you might be measuring and see how that corresponds with what happens at the national level. All right, so my main points today are going to be recognizing that uh, policy innovation can be defined differently for different projects and at different stages of projects. Um, the re our research is showing that not only in terms of sustainability and planning, but across many of the things that local governments do, such policy evaluation and measurement is rarely done. Um, despite the evidence that measurement does help improve policy making decisions, and so at the end of my presentation, I'll go through some of the challenges that uh, planners and other local government officials must overcome in order to um, uh, to do some um, to do measurement and evaluation. Okay, so if we think about a program and a policy that we're putting into place, we have basically these five steps that you can see on the screen now. We plan it, we implement it, we wrap it up, we see some immediate results just past the output, and then we see if there are long-term results. And with each of these stages, we can see that there are different kinds of evaluation that we need to think about. As we're planning it, we're going to measure whether or not, you know, what, whether or not we think this makes sense as you know, we push along. What have other people done? During the um, process evaluation, um, we can, uh, you know, while we're implementing the program, we, you know, we're searching for new opportunities. We're making sure our resources are used appropriately. We're maintaining the standards of the program. Um, then in terms of, you know, once the program is done, once it's fully up and running, is the program delivering the output, the actual thing? And I'll give some examples of these uh, in a minute, so when I use the word thing, you can figure out what I'm talking about. Um, and then the two things that we rarely do, even when we do evaluation, is did we change the target group and did we finally have any lasting impact? Uh, has our program, has our policy done anything that will stick around? after um, the project is officially complete. And now we stopped going forward for some reason. Hold on one second, I apologize. Let's try this again. There we go. So for one of my examples is um, a uh, the community solar program, for example. And a formative evaluation answers questions such as, how does the solar program compare to others? Um, you know, are we doing things the way other people who've done good programs do this? In terms of process evaluation, we think about, you know, are we signing up suppliers? Are we holding the number of public meetings we expect it to be, you know, that we put into our plan, et cetera? Um, are we making progress through the, uh, the, the program? Then at the end, you might say, well, are there actually more solar panels in the community? Did we get X number of solar panels out there? Then you might ask, you know, for, for past the output, the outcome of the project, did we make it easier for residents to buy solar over the long term? Are the sales continuing? Have we started to change things? And then ultimately, did we reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Or did we reduce dependency on fossil fuels? Or, or whatever the bigger mission was? Um, sometimes a lot of the programs that we put into place we think have these impacts, but they've not really been tested. 
and some of them aren't the place of local uh, officials to evaluate all the way down through impact. But these are the kinds of things that we think about when we're wondering whether or not our programs are working in the big sense working or not. And then in terms of creating a walkable downtown, um, a form of evaluation might be during the comprehensive planning process, you know, getting the ideas from other places, understanding what this kind of looks like. Um, then there might not be a process there because the output is, did we pass the zoning to reshape our downtown? And often our evaluation stops there. Our success is measured, yes, we passed the zoning. But then we never, especially when we're dealing with zoning because things take so much time, look, think back to say, oh, did the buildings come up to the curb? Are we, you know, putting in the uh, street furniture that we need? Um, is, is, there, is the change actually happening? And then ultimately, are more people walking? Are more people shopping? Are we reducing vehicle miles traveled? So you can see the different kinds of evaluations that, uh, that there are possibly. So what we did, um, and before we get to your survey, is I'm going to introduce our survey. We, had a, we did a survey of local governments across the country in 2015. We did this, um, was conducted by the International City County Management Association. Um, and we had about 1,900 municipalities, towns, and counties respond. And this was a follow-up to another survey that we didn't do, but uh, was built on the backs of uh, another ICMA survey uh, in 2010. And that uh, was funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And there was a lot of input to this, including from our uh, partners at the Sustainable Communities Division and at the Small Town and Rural Planning Division. They helped us shape the survey. Um, they participated in practice groups and, and reviewed the survey with us and promoted it through their divisions. So now what I want to do is, before we go to the results, our um, organizer, Ben, is going to stop popping up. We have three questions that we want to um, ask you in the audience to answer. So Ben, if you could grab it. And if you could now click on your screen. Um, yes or no, whether or not uh, you've measured any kind of planning or sustainability policies in your community. Yes or no. I want to have a little uh, countdown clock for everyone to build the tension and make it uh, uh, more imperative that people click in. And Ben, when you see that there's a good chunk of answers coming in, why don't you um, flick us to the next one, close this one out. Okay, George, we are at about uh, two-thirds right now. You want me to close it out? Okay, we're going to get five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Close it out. <laughs> that always works with my students. This is how I get them to finally do what I need to do, is really ramp up the pressure. And you want to see the results now? Sure, pop up the results. Okay. So 50, oh, okay, so I'm going to make some notes of these. We have 58% that said no and 42% that said yes. Okay. All right, if we could pop up to the next one, we're going to ask you now, what are the areas that you do do evaluation in, in terms of planning and sustainability? Select just the one that you do, one of these, you know, maybe the one you do the most in, or maybe the one that you do, um, uh, did first if you need uh, if you do it in more than one area oh it says check up the three but then select only one I apologize <laughs> I suspect you're only going to be able to select one if you can click on three that's great but start with the one you like the most um, we run into they run into these problems in the classroom too And humbly admit my mistake and let the students laugh at me. Yes, Ben. And we are at about 60% now. Okay. A couple more seconds. Three, two, one more. Okay. Pop up the answers. Energy, 14%. Water conservation, 11%. Green buildings, 8%. Uh, BMT, 13%. And don't is 54%, which is appropriate given what we had in the first slide. All right, and now the final poll question, which, is, which gets us to these different levels of, of um, evaluation. Is this having an impact? Are you adjusting policy based on your evaluation? Do you talk about it with your elected officials? 
have you or your staff reviewed this and said we need to change things because something is not going in and not working right or we can tweak it and make it better? And we're now at 50%. Okay, give us another five seconds. All righty. 46 don't, okay. Sorry for those of you who don't who had to bear through this. I'm not adjusted 26% and adjusted based on evaluations 28%, almost the same number. Okay. All right, so um, we asked very similar questions. Let's see, you're going to turn it back over to me, Ben? Or is it, oh, I'm here, okay. Um, we asked very similar questions on our poll. And um, we asked it in energy conservation, water conservation, quality of life indicators, and recycling. And um, then we asked whether or not the program has been successful, which is a refinement of the question that we asked you. So we asked people, and we asked this in two ways. Do you track the impact of energy conservation problems on energy usage by your government? Did you change the light bulbs at City Hall? Are you changing the street lights? Things like that. Um, a third of people, almost a third of people said yes, they do, as opposed to the 14% in our little poll that said, um, that said yes. Um, and so that's an interesting discrepancy. I will say that I don't know the, the, the audience of the people who joined this uh, webinar. I sus suspect you all have sustain, you know, you do sustainability things, but I do think my national poll biased a little bit in favor of people who do do things. And then if you did, yes, did, did you see um, energy reduced in government operations? And the answer was, Overwhelming of those 30% that did something, 90% did see an improvement. Was it the measurement that brought the improvement, or are they doing the right things? Is a question that um, is something that we'll dig into with future research. Um, this is um, another way we ask the question because we're wondering about how people get out to the community. Do you track conservation programs in terms of weatherization or in terms of promoting solar power um, in the community? And only about 8% do this. Um, and I will say that uh, and many fewer communities actually undertake these kind of operations um, as well, which explains why even fewer people tr attract it. And again, about 50, uh, almost two-thirds did see uh, that their program was having an impact. And if you have green buildings, and um, we had, uh, this was about the same, 12% uh, of people um, well, here we don't ask if they tracked. Here we ask the question a little bit differently. We ask just if you've seen more green buildings, if you have these policies. 12% um, said, yes, they do see more uh, green buildings with these policies. Interestingly, 11%, uh, a similar number, don't um, see that. And then about our survey, 8% of you in the audience uh, do track changes in green buildings. Um, through your community. And that's an interesting thing too, how would you track that? And uh, when we're doing the questions at the end, if people you know, want to comment on these results or, or have uh, information that they can fill in, um, add it at the question and answer at the end because it would be really interesting to see how this comes through. I want to start to wrap up because I need to give people, uh, the rest of the team, more time. But this was the results for water conservation. Only 20% um, said that they uh, track conservation on uh, programs on water usage, which was um, uh, twice as many as the people in our audience. Um, which is interesting too, because you know the vast majority of local governments do do, um, um, at least in urban and sub many suburban areas, do provide the water service. So it's interesting why this is so low. But again, when it's tracked, they are seeing that this is working. And do you track quality of life indicators? Only about a quarter do. Um, do you track recycling programs? 44% yes. Um, and this is really interesting because I would have thought, given that most communities have to pay for this, if they have, because they have to pay for garbage, um, I would have thought that number would have been higher. Maybe there's a lot of pri places with private uh, delivery of uh, service delivery on garbage um, that might reduce that. But it, oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to change the uh, slide here. But 84% of those ignore the words, but the numbers are 
84% of those people who do um, uh, do track the uh, recycling uh, do see improvement program. This is a comparison across all of the areas, and we can see that recycling is the highest of all of them, and I do think that's because it's probably the most mature industry, um, the most mature sustainability, big sustainability policy, and one of the easiest to measure. And then the energy conservation in government is also fairly easy to measure if you can get your hands on all of the electrical bills. Um, why is our rates of measurement though overall so slow? Just quickly, um, you know, it's hard to collect a lot of this data. Often in a program, the money's not built in to do the evaluation. That's something to keep in mind as these things go forward. And it'll be interesting as we hear the examples of the people uh, coming up, how they've made allowances for evaluating, uh, making sure that the goals are part of it, goals are in there. Um, the, uh, also recognizing what may cause recycling to go up or down or energy usage to go up and down is an important part of your evaluation process. Was it that you put a new program in place or did energy prices just spike for some reason? Um, politics is, is often an issue. Um, sometimes, you know, me and, we in, the acad in academia are called to do the evaluation and we don't make our results necessarily easy for the public and policymakers to, uh, to figure out what, what happened. Um, and then also, sometimes uh, the results of evaluation push against uh, vested interests or deeply held beliefs. And, and these are the, uh, the list of um, reasons that things don't work out so well. But my hope, and this is my last slide, is that, the, um, that it is a little bit easier in some of these areas because we have bills, there's money involved. And I'm hoping that this pushes local governments to do more evaluation in sustainability and planning as well as across all the services that they do. I'm sorry I've gone way over time. Um, I will, uh, Ben, if you can now turn it over to the next person who's on the list, that would be great. And I look forward to hearing how they've pulled together some of the, and overcome some of the challenges that I've mentioned. And Kim, if you can tell, you, me, tell me who to turn it over to, that'd be great. Yeah, Jim is next. Okay. Going over to Jim. Uh, that was a great overview. I think the results of your survey, George, are very helpful to give us a sense of the landscape. Um, so now we're going to dive into some kind of real-world examples of, of folks diving in. Uh, Jim Yanger is uh, the founder of Climate Action Associates, a sustainability planning consulting firm that supports a variety of state and local government clients nationwide. He has more than 20 years of experience in sustainability policy and greenhouse gas planning at all levels of government. He currently leads CAA's Technical Products Development Services and its State and Local Program Innovation Consulting. For New York, uh, specifically NYSERDA, he facilitated and drafted the New York Greenhouse Gas Protocol backing New York's regional sustainability plan and designed the metric strategy for NYSERDA's Cleaner Greener Communities Program. Prior to Climate Action Associates, uh, Jim was my colleague over at ICLE. Jim, you want to take it over? Uh, yes, hello, Ken. Um, but I have to report, I'm not able to, again, we had this problem, I'm not able to actually build my screen at the time the site, so if you want to proceed, maybe go in and go to the slide. Yep, just need somebody to share the screen with me. I'll do that. Share the, okay, thanks. Can you see it? Oops, Jim, are you there? <laughs> All right, I do not see it yet. Okay, let's see. Jim, can you see the screen? I cannot. In the okay. Jim, why don't, you, why don't we why don't you, move to the next speaker? I can restart, and hopefully that solves that, the problem. That, or you can just open the PowerPoint uh, on your screen, and Joanna can advance in pace. Yeah, because you guys are seeing it out there, right? Yes. Okay. So, Jim, if you want to get started, I'll just click through for you. 
Okay. Uh, again, I'm sorry. I'll try to go a little bit faster. Uh, no so today we're going to talk about uh, New York State strategy to help empower local communities uh, with data to measure and manage and monitor their local sustainability programs. Next slide, please. New York strategy is focused at the state level on empowering through the Public Service Commission a series of regulatory uh, policy to empower local governments um, to implement certain policies, and then through NYSERDA, the State Energy Office, to uh, provide technical resources and funding for those communities. Next slide, please. Through the Reforming Energy Vision uh, program in New York, this is led by the Public Service Commission, this represents a, a real change in the way the utility uh, operational model is happening. Um, it's specifically one component, it's a big thing, but one component just to, to empower local communities to uh, enable things like community choice aggregation, case financing, um, and work with utilities to enable uh, implementing microgrids and, and enhanced solar interconnections and other things like this. Um, in New York, there we're working on uh, making sure there are LED streetlight tariffs and buyback programs. So this is part of uh, the Public Service Commission strategy to empower local government. Uh, next slide, please. Next strategy, uh, the State Energy Office, is to implement the Clean Energy Fund. And they have established a new communities and local governments team, which is focused on providing capacity, technical resources, and assistance to local towns, villages, cities, counties, to implement a series of high impact actions from energy codes to clean fleets, among other things. And their, their marquee program was called the Cleaner Greener Community Program. It is now evolved to be the uh, Clean Energy uh, Community Program. Uh, very importantly is that NYSERDA, as a state energy office, is now recognizing that there is a, a nexus between community planning and sustainability, and they are now incentivizing and, and supporting things like local energy and sustainability planning, uh, supporting uh, development, community development projects that feature lead ND principles, walkability, and other things. Um, they're focusing, and they've also supported regional sustainability plans. And this is new for a state energy office, and, and in some cases was uncomfortable territory uh, to start you know, working on these issues. Many energy offices are, were traditionally not to both uh, energy technology shops, but but uh, we are evolving here in New York. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so NYSERDA, as part of its strategy to incentivize and help local communities implement sustainability, also realizes that communities want their actions to be locally driven, driven by metrics and results oriented. oriented. And so as NYSERDA, thinking about ways to help out, um, has asked when it provides incentives to communities through its programs, most, for most programs, it asks communities now to report back its benefits through a project benefits metrics template that provides guidance and, and resources on how to compute greenhouse gas emissions, energy savings, jobs, and other things. But the challenge of this, and as the state is realizing as we're helping them think through this, we really are continuing to put the onus on local communities to go out and get their data, and as uh, George just you know, mentioned it is difficult to get, and NYSERDA is realizing that this is very challenging for communities to do. Um, we're getting a lot of feedback that uh, it's difficult to get the kind of information that NYSERDA is seeking. Next slide, please. So as an example, uh, and Joanna, you can just advance to the next slide for the animation. This is an example of a community trying to get uh, energy data from the utility. So if you go out and the community uh, wants to find out what kind of energy is happening within its, uh, in its boundaries, uh, traditionally utility, the community just have to randomly ask their utilities. And as you can see from this slide, it's really just chaos. And uh, it's very inefficient for individual communities to go out and get this. And as George alluded in the slide, I think it only 8% of communities are actually trying to figure out their community energy baseline. And there's a reason why. It's difficult. It's expensive. And the data you get doing this, trying to reach out to a utility for data, it's just it's not effective when it happens you know, in a one-off way like this. So uh, next slide, please. So pulling back as a, as a state, we started to think about well, how can we solve this problem? And, and how can we actually deliver data? Is there, is there a way to just make data, energy data, available to communities? 
so that you don't have to ask for it anymore, and it's just and it's just there. And, and you think about it, there's a lot of data through the census that's open, accessible population, economic data, household education patterns, all of there are available, free, accessible to anyone with a computer. Why can't we do this with energy demographics? If we're going to be implementing sustainability, really energy data is the next frontier. And we started thinking about how we could do this. How can we get energy consumption, peak loads, energy mixes um, published and, and open? And we realized the first thing is that our utilities in New York are critical partners. Utilities do uh, manage and meter all the energy that, that leaves the grid and as well as enters the grid through distributed energy resources and, and solar and things like that. So we knew that they were going to be important. Um, next slide, please. So again, thinking at 30,000 foot level, this really becomes a big data challenge. And if we're trying to work with utilities to start crowdsourcing energy demographics in, across the country, there's 3,000 utilities. There's large investor-owned utilities, small ones, municipal, rural cooperatives, and everything in between. Um, there's no particular standard for doing this. And if we're going to try to create a standard, we're going to need some movement to create a common way for utilities to do this. We're going to have to standardize these energy demographics, like almost like census data, across a, a data type, a geography resolution, and a reporting frequency. Um, we, we're going to have to align it to census so that all the data we, we start developing is going to be valuable for planners like yourself. Next slide, please. Uh, so visually, just to help ourselves think through this, we step back and realize how can this possibly happen? Well, let's just think about it. If we start with some sort of common map of the country, uh, that's highly resolved and goes down to census tracts and blocks and, and then just like the census does, then uh, next slide, what if we ask one major utility to start dropping some data into that? Next slide, sorry for this. Uh, then if we ask another major utility, uh, next slide, and finally a municipal utility and, and as many others as we can get, next slide to the uh, question. What if we start creating a movement around the country? If we if not hundreds or maybe thousands of utilities who've been reporting this data in a consistent way, will we have something here that's cool and uh, and, and really something that will be valuable for, for planning and for energy and sustainability planning? And uh, we think so. So next next slide. With, with all these big ideas, we sat down and decided to implement a project called the Utility Energy Registry. We piloted, piloted this through the New York State uh, Climate Smart Community Program. Um, between 2012 and 2015. We coordinated with all of the state's uh, investor-owned utilities and uh, developed common standards for publishing and developing data. We developed data for 1,300 cities, towns, and villages over a period of five years. All the data was organized and supplied by the utility. It was completely voluntary. All of the utilities we approached participated. None said no. Um, and they Gained. The reason why they did it was simply uh, to, to gain value and, and, and to make their lives easier um, to, instead of meeting one-off requests. So we found a lot of goodwill in doing this. We were sort of, we were surprised, but uh, uh, we got quite a lot of uptake in doing this. And we've created what we think is the first national model standardized doing this. Next slide, please. Again, as I said, this was 100% voluntary. It was a win-win approach to doing this. Um, we work together with utilities and, and community representatives and planners to design exactly what the data should look like. And then we sat down and technically worked with the utilities to figure out how to align all their billing data to these, um, to these maps. And then figured out in step three how to automate all of this so they can publish the data routinely once per year and keep it updated. And again, so communities can simply get their data without ever having to ask for it. Uh, next slide, please. So in 2016, uh, this year, based on the results of the pilot project, uh, the Public Service Commission in New York under its Rev Track 2 order issued in the spring of 2016, um, that order implements a number of different uh, reforms within utilities or, or defines a roadmap to do so. In that order, it does recognize the Utility Energy Registry project. It, it asks utilities and NYSERDA to continue to collaborate on developing this project and create the mandate for uh, NYSERDA and utilities to collaborate to solve outstanding technical issues, such as privacy thresholds and things like this that continue to be barriers for making this data open and public. We have a current a utility working group for UER underway in New York that was established last month. Uh, next slide, please. So 
I'm going to show you a couple of screenshots, and Joanne, I hope you can keep up. I'm going to try to do this quickly. Uh, just before I do, um, it, it, what, what you're going to see here is not the, the outcome of the utility registry. It isn't a website. It is a, a, a comprehensive project that is a protocol that is that is developed by uh, as a collaborative effort with planners and utilities, and then there's a web application. And our goal here is to uh, is have the data through APIs easily accessible to third-party developers. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to, Joanne, I'm going to run through them on slide number 18, if you can, I don't know if you can know that. Um, I'll show you a couple screenshots. Here's a, here's a screenshot of the utility registry application. It is running. Um, we, we've listed here in New York just all of our utilities. We have 65 utilities, and uh, the, this map shows which ones are participating, uh, which communities are covered by utilities that have been providing data. Um, next slide. Here's some examples. Uh, here's a map. It should be a purple map. This is an example of all the energy data for a specific year 2010 uh, lined up for electricity for, from all the utilities that are reporting. If you look at the left side of the, the right side of the screen, there's a whole bunch of filters. You can choose uh, geographic resolution and electricity or and natural gas. You can choose your sector, residential, commercial, industrial. You can look at street lighting and, and public authorities consumption and a number of different things. You can choose your resolution from annual to monthly, um, things like this. Uh, next slide, please. You can filter against a specific utility. Here's an example. If, if we're following along, this is National Grid Service Territory. Um, this is a subset of data they published for year 2014 for, and I'm looking at the slide, it's the residential consumption um, sector. Uh, next slide, please. So you can also go in and click on an individual community. In this case, you can see Saratoga Springs. You click on it. You can start drilling down um, into exactly what's going on in Saratoga Springs. Next slide. Um, please, you can see a time series of data here. This is the trending in Saratoga Springs. So again, going back to George's comment, we're only 8% of communities are trying to figure out what's going on energy-wise. There's, there's a reason for that. It's, it's just too hard to do, and, um, and local planners are not in the business of chasing energy data. And so through this process and through state support working with utilities, we're trying to solve that by making this data accessible. Um, next slide, please. Here's an example, City of Rochester with monthly resolution data. We're working with our utilities to publish data the maximum resolution possible. Your monthly data will enable a community to look at that seasonal program um, as well as larger annual goals. Um, next slide, please. Here's an example of the utility domain here, uh, this is National Grid's natural gas debt down in New York City. This is zip code level data. Uh, this is better quality than, obviously, municipal or county data. And again, it's an example of, as this program evolves, we're hoping to get better and better resolution data down the census tract, eventually blocks and things in the future um, if we're successful. Uh, next, next screen. Here's just an example of, of an actual of the data, which really is just a monstrously large data set. It's available through APIs in, in the cloud. Um, through through the, the web app, there's a, there's a grid. You can literally go through and filter all of the data and, and simply download it. The, the goal for this little website that you're seeing here is just to show people what this product's about. Most of the analysis will be done by individual planners with themselves, pulling data and, and using it in your own plans, and, and that's the intent. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you should be looking at here a, a dashboard. We're working on, a, on a, an approach for utilities to be able to log in and manage and upload their own data. It automates the whole process. So a utility, any utility of the hopefully 3,000 in the country can log in, register, to find the service territory, download templates, upload them, and they're done. Um, we're hoping this will be done as part of annual uh, reporting uh, from each utility. So uh, next slide, please. I just have a few left. Uh, is now, with the success of the utility registry, project in New York. Um, we're very excited about moving this to become a national registry to start engaging other states. And next slide, please, number 28. Uh, we're very pleased to announce that the Department of Energy's State Energy Program last month announced that through its State Energy Program that NYSERDA shall receive, or it intends to receive, it's not negotiated formally yet, but $423,000 through NYSERDA to implement the UER partner states that are working with NYSERDA. They are Maryland, Washington, D.C., Minnesota. Uh, there are several supporting states that, per, that are participating, Connecticut and New Jersey. The work is going to be implemented by local uh, implementation partners, mostly universities, um, University of Maryland, regional planning agencies. 
government and not profit, not not for profit, but just a great place. Work is going to start on January 1st, 2017. We hope uh, we're expecting that. Um, and the goal here is to work together, need a national standard, perhaps I call it a green button for a demographic. Uh, each of the states, um, our, our goal again is to develop a national working group, um, working with these states and others. And everyone here can be invited. If you're interested, you contact us. Um, and each of the states are worked through a standard scope of work that we did in New York to implement this project. Um, as you can see, some of the bullets here. So uh, next slide and last slide. So we're issuing a call to all the planners here on this call and all the APA chapters to get involved and, and promote this. Um, you're welcome to participate in our UER national working group that we're going to be establishing uh, after January of this coming year. Please promote the UER in your state. This is something that's interesting to you. And, and, and get involved and take charge. Um, you can host a UER chapter or ever, however we figure out how to do this as a team. Um, and implement your own work plan, just like the other states. In fact, NYSERDA is going to attempt to accommodate additional states into this thing um, without any additional cost. And so as long as we can organize states that are interested, um, we can pull it together. And uh, we, we pretty much know the work plan. So again, if you're interested, you want to see this happening, happen in your state, contact us and uh, set up a meeting, and we'll be happy to uh, discuss it with you. So with that, I think I'm done. I, we can pass it on to, uh, to Wayne. And uh, you can take it over. Great. Thank you, Jim. That's a, a great tool. Uh, it seems to make it easier for folks to get their energy data uh, so they can be reporting on that. We know that's an important sustainability metric. Our next speaker is Wayne Fiden. Wayne is the Director of Planning and Sustainability for Northampton, Massachusetts, and a part-time lecturer of practice at the University of Massachusetts. He led Northampton to earn the nation's first five-star community rating for sustainability and the highest Commonwealth Capital score, which is the former Massachusetts scoring for municipal sustainability efforts, as well as bicycle-friendly, pedestrian-friendly, APA Great Streets, and National Historic Trust Distinctive Communities designations. In this role, he's helped address transportation, amenities, land use, downtown revitalization, and planning for active and healthy communities. Wayne's a fellow of AICP. He is a wealth of knowledge, and uh, we're thrilled to have him on the panel today. Wayne? Thank you. So our, our background is Northampton considers itself as a progressive community, a lot of interest here in sustainability. But when we started talking about sustainability, we adopted a sustainable Northampton master plan. We realized it was becoming an excuse for some people to be anti-growth. It was just one more way to say, not in my backyard, because that's somehow not, not environmentally sustainable. And so it's really important for us to change the conversation to make sure people thought about everything that sustainability involves. So we began with the traditional, the three E's, environment, economy, and equity. And even then, people sort of didn't quite understand what do they all mean. This is our, our logo up here, um, our three-way yin-yang became our, our logo for what planning office is all about, trying to sort of find not just a balance, making sure every action we do goes through a lens of sustainability. Um, so, you know, my own background in trying to understand what sustainability meant or how, how we assessed it better was I did a research report for APA and then later a uh, Fulbright in New Zealand trying to look at, you know, what were people doing for sustainability and how were people assessing it. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but sort of three, the five points on the slide were the things that seemed most important. The, the first one is this accountability. We all talk about doing these great aspirational plans. We know that there's a problem with sort of greenwashing of people saying we're doing great things but not really doing great things. Um, and it seemed like the most important way to, to get the word out to our community that what we're doing really counts is to figure out some way to measure what sustainability is. We're not just saying, oh, we're doing good things, but we're trying to figure out some way that we do that. Um, in order for it to work for the community, we need to find indicators that both measure sustainability, but also measure sustainability in a way the public can understand. So it's great if I have pages and pages of charts, but most of my community members' eyes are going to gloss over if we do that. And so we need to figure out 
indicators that really came alive to the community that, that resonated with the public so people could say, yes, we're doing a good job, we're not doing a good job. Um, and so that brought us to, I think, the biggest debate that I see out there is, do we, we want to create our, our own indicators, our own metrics? The benefit for that is we can make sure that metrics match exactly what the community is trying to achieve. You can write a comprehensive plan and say, here's where we measure how we're doing it. Um, we can involve the community in the discussion. We can make sure that those indicators really resonate with us. The problem with that is that's an enormous amount of work. And even when you do it, it's hard to prove that you're not cooking the books. So the alternative approach is to use somebody else's framework a national framework, a regional framework, something that sort of helps us make sure that we're looking at our community the same way other people are looking at our community. Um, and, you know, for us, what we're trying to get ultimately is sort of thinking of sustainability as two things. One is a series of outcomes and actions that are sustainable, that are taking us in the right direction. And the other that's maybe even more important for us is just a lens to look at everything that we do. So no matter how many things we do, we can't always anticipate what our action will be. But if we have an educated community and educated policymakers, and we, we measure enough of our actions, then we come up with new actions we hadn't anticipated. The hope is we all get that you know this is what sustainability is. We went, when we did our comprehensive plan, one of the things that it called for is upzoning a lot of areas close to downtown, where it basically doubled and tripled the allowable density. And it was, a, you can guess, it was a big political battle. It took three years to get the zoning through, a lot of contentious meetings. But ultimately, when it came to city council, it passed city council by unanimous vote. Um, and it was the, the council president who said, we all sat through sustainable Northampton. And if we really believe in sustainability, we have to believe in, in infill in our, in our downtown areas. And so it was really, you know, if, we, if, if sustainability had just been buying more conservation areas, we wouldn't have been able to build that sort of political consensus that, that got there. Um, and, and so, you know, we, all, we know sustainability when we see it, right? So they're all great examples. I won't go through these slides in Northampton, everything from our trash being picked up by bicycles to recycling an old building to the building on the right has some of the highest end condos in the city and the absolute lowest end uh, uh, homeless shelter. Um, so we have lots of great examples, but how do you measure that? I mean, there's not a lot of measurements to say rich people living with poor people is equal to sustainability. Um, and this is an old cartoon, I think, from The New Yorker about basically, you know, the increase in the use of the word sustainability. So we, we wanted to make sure that people really, sustainability meant something. It wasn't so watered down that it doesn't mean anything. Um, so after a lot of looking for us, we decided that the STAR Communities Rating Program was the one that did all the important things for us. It, it had enough understandable um, metrics that they would resonate with the community. It looked across the board at a lot of different measures, which is important for us. It was nationally normed. Um, not everything fits. You know, a lot of focus on uh, saving water for drought, and that's not generally the issue in the Northeast, but it was it was close enough for us that became the mechanism that, that we went through. Um, and so I just want to go through just sort of their metrics quickly and talk about how each were relevant. I'm using Northampton examples, but I'm trying to give the lessons that we got for them for, for that could apply elsewhere. So you know, store. I'm going to go back one slide. So STAR breaks things down into these uh, six or seven metrics, or seven categories. Um, and you have goals, and objectives, and, and individual measures for each one of these categories. So I, just have, I have one slide per metric. So the first one for us was climate energy. Um, this is looking at energy use and, and climate mitigation and climate adaptation. And again, we, we love the STAR process. One has to be really careful of trend lines. So that red line that doesn't go very far, that's the current trend in Northampton. And so if you look at what we're doing, you'd say, oh, Northampton really has it together. You know, we're on this really aggressive track to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and re dramatically reduce our energy use. Um, all of which is true, but the reality is what that big drop in that line represents is the state being really aggressive about getting utilities to switch from coal to natural gas, and Northampton reducing municipal operations energy by about 
Um, so that's great. We, you know, we made a big jump, and if you look at the trend line, we're exactly in the right spot. But if we do this five years from now, I know we're going to be diverging from that trend line because we've done mostly what we can do for city operations, and the state's done the easy stuff they can do for um, statewide electric use. And so the trend lines have to be careful of, you know, what does this really mean? And, and so even if star just says by trend line, we for internal use try to sort of project, okay, we're following that line, but what's going to stop us from moving forward? Why is it going to get harder going forward? Um, and then I think for us, one of the things that we found that was absent the most in the community discussion, although I think the city was doing a lot, was a big focus on equity empowerment. So when I go to conferences, uh, I hear people talking a lot about environmental sustainability and, and about economic sustainability. And equity is either not discussed or it's discussed with incredible frustration. We know we need to do more. How do we do more of that? Um, so that same building in the bottom right, I talked about we're really proud that we got highest end condos in the city on a per square foot price um, and the absolute lowest cost housing together in one building. And the upper left is a, um, a brownfield site that we got somebody to clean up right next to an affordable housing project. So, and we're frankly less proud of our achievements. The, the number of pictures I can show you is relatively limited. But what we are really proud of is it just becomes a lens. When we buy uh, new open space parcels, when we pave new sidewalks, we at least have the discussion on who's, who's benefiting from these and who isn't benefiting from these. So next one is built environment. This is probably one of the broadest category because the way STAR has this is land use and transportation is all in the same category. Um, and again, you know, the challenge for us is thinking about the context of where you are. So for example, in Northampton, about I think it's 61% of our journeys to work are done in single occupancy vehicles. And so if I was in Boston or New York or San Francisco or Chicago or any major city, I would be incredibly embarrassed by that number. Um, but we're a city of 30,000 people, and for 30,000 people, getting it down to 61% is actually good. Most cities our size, most you know, suburban communities and smaller communities have a bigger number. And so it's really important to think in terms of the context of, is this number make sense for where you are or not make sense for, for where you are? Um, and likewise, this lens was really useful for us. So the, up, the picture in the upper left is a dense urban neighborhood, and that's actually a submarine periscope factory. And it was quite controversial where community doesn't really have a lot of support for military, peace, military operations, and so people didn't like that, and they didn't like the fact that you know, a periscope factory is not exactly mixed use. Um, but we use that sustainability lens to say, well, this is the old New England model of the mills right at the edge of the village where people could walk to work instead of everyone having to drive. Um, and it fits with the housing, just uh, this, the bottom left part of the picture, which was right across the street from that. That yes, we're really trying to create new urban villages, um, maybe in some ways matching the, the old New England model. Um, the, the next category, about economy and jobs, again, this is sort of like the context piece. But some of the stories work better in an urban environment than a suburban environment, and some work better in suburban, and some work better in rural. Northampton was the first five-star community under the ranking system, and I think we're now one of four or five, um, which is partially, of course, because we're an amazing community, not surprising, I'm going to say that, um, but also because we are a downtown community, so for a city of 30,000 people, we have four homeless shelters, we have 13% affordable housing, we have a lot of things that are very urban and focused. The picture on the bottom left is adult education and the home for our Center for New Americans. So even though we, we run from urban to rural, we have a lot of urban things that would be hard for a lot of rural communities and suburban communities to get. And then because our community goes out to rural areas, we buy half a percent of the city per year is open space. We've been doing that for 30 years. So right now we're up to 20% of the city is probably protected. So again, there's some things that are easier in rural areas than urban areas. So you can't always compare what one community scores for another. You have to understand the context. But the score is really good at letting the community understand, you know, how are we doing at least compared to our peers within these in different areas out there. Um, and then a couple things that I found really interesting about STAR that, that is what attracted us to it in the first place was 
getting community members to think outside the box of exactly what do they think is sustainability. So this line about expect and unexpected. Most people would say dealing with childhood asthma. That needs to be part of sustainability if we really care about social equity. But we have a big focus on dealing with a built environment to make it healthier. And Massachusetts doesn't have county government and health department to local government. And so we realize a lot of the small towns near us don't really have any capacity. Um, and so even though I only represent a city of 30,000 people, we end up agreeing to sponsor a 14-town effort that Northampton's the lead community in to sort of help make all 14 towns healthier with, with a series of actions. Um, and that's the sort of thing under story. You get credit for, for being innovative. But for us, it's, it's just it's part of the message to say, if we believe in sustainability, we can't put our, you know, can't just focus on our community. We need to think about the broader context for where we're going. Um, and then, you know, the last comment in terms of thinking broadly about sustainability, that's probably my single favorite thing about STAR, is it really does get people to think differently about what makes sustainability. So the, the picture on the upper left was the first legal gay marriage in Massachusetts, which happened in Northampton. But you get points for STAR communities about ethnic diversity, about cultural events. My community is pretty overwhelmingly white. But for us, diversity is partially about our Latino population. It's also partially about a very large lesbian population. And so just sort of thinking, well, why is that part of sustainability? It's we're not really a sustainable community if people don't talk to each other. And so thinking about the arts, thinking about education, thinking about our cultural landscapes are all part of what, what makes us a sustainable community is really important. Um, and then this is my last slide, but just so if we, I began with this three-way yin-yang is really important for us as a lens for sustainability is also really important for us as a lens for sustainability assessments. Right? So if we're just looking at energy and, and greenhouse gas emissions, which are really important, but we're missing a big part of the story. So, thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, what a great overview. Certainly, uh, you and Northampton have been leaders on uh, sustainability metrics. And congratulations again for your five-star award. Um, our next speaker is Joanna Nadow. She's the Director of Community Programs, overseeing the Sustainable Communities and Green Neighborhoods programs for Audubon International. She has extensive experience coordinating and implementing sustainability programs and over a decade of professional experience in natural resources conservation, research policy, and community planning. In the interest of time, I think we'll just move right on to her presentation. Joanna? Great. Thank you, Kim. Um, and thanks to everybody for joining us, and thanks to my fellow panelists. Um, this webinar actually came out of conversations that we've been having in the Northeast Regional Sustainability Network, which is a program um, I'm leading from the EPA Sustainable Communities Division as a champion. Um, and so we're really interested in this question for a variety of reasons. Um, you've heard some really inspiring examples of how people are working to push the edge. Um, and I'm hoping to give you now some, some practical ways to think about and um, select uh, metrics or indicators for your community. I'm really interested in this question because my work with communities in the Sustainable Communities Program at Audubon International involves helping communities choose and measure appropriate indicators for their sustainability programs and plans. Um, and you know, when we realize that sustainability means that you know, those economic, social, and environmental aspects are interconnected, it also creates a tangled web to manage. Um, and so since we know we can't you know, manage what we don't measure, we're all wading into the fray of evaluating sustainable practices from energy sources to development practices, to recreation choices, to ensure that we're actually creating communities that are more sustainable. And, and hopefully we can learn from each other as we go. So metrics or indicators um, used, can be used to evaluate our sustainability practices and need to be, I think, um, tied to local issues, uh, local concerns, and local data. They need to be practical to measure, so picking indicators that you know you can measure, um, either because you have existing data sources available or it would require only you know, a feasible level of staff or partner input. Um, and then I think you should keep track of metrics that you want to measure, but you don't have access to now. Um, keeping that list is great in case data later becomes available and to guide funding or information requests in the future. 
And then um, I think it's critical that metrics are relevant to the goals and actions in your community that you're trying to achieve and link directly between the goals and the metrics. So the Audubon International Sustainable Communities Program is a structured process for communities to incorporate sustainability into plans and practices. Um, and we give technical assistance along the way. But the key steps work from a baseline assessment and checklist where um, sort of a framework like Wayne was mentioning, where communities can evaluate their existing practices against an inventory of best practices developed from around the country. Um, and they inventory a bunch of areas around the community that influence sustainability. So the list on the right are the focus areas that we look at in that assessment. And then we score them based on only those practices that are applicable in their local setting. Um, we are looking for public and private practices, not just those done by the local government, but those that are happening from other partners or um, homeowners, let's say, in the community. Um, and in that assessment, we're determining you know, constraints to action and initial priorities. So based on that assessment, then you can build a long-term plan of action and begin to implement that plan over time. Creating a long-term sustainability plan of action, I think, should be built from an external assessment and um, internal priorities, understanding of internal existing uh, practices and constraints and sort of your readiness as a community. And then put in together the goals that you have for your community with immediate, medium, and long-term actions that can be then integrated into plans and budgets um, and ultimately use it to improve your sustainability performance or your, your rating if you're using a STAR uh, community's rating. So the, the action plan includes existing programs that you want to continue and then expanding or developing new programs. Um, we're also looking at policies and practices. And as I mentioned before, it should include not just the city, but local partners, businesses, and residents. And then all these items can be written in such a way that there's a clear link to how they'll be incorporated into future comprehensive plans, for example, or annual budgeting processes. And then we can create metrics that measure whether the action chosen um, has been implemented, those output measures, as George described, and then those, um, the outcome and impact measures, whether the action actually achieves the goals set out for it. So here's a sample sustainability action plan section. Um, I think it's, it's just trying to emphasize here that not, these aren't new goals or even necessarily new strategies, um, but we're linking them with indicators and we're trying to evaluate policies alongside their various outcomes. So having data on health reflected back in our planning for transportation and recreation, for example, or our data on water quality reflected back to how we're managing our, our local areas, local landscapes. Um, so each goal is set, then we have an action or strategy to be implemented, an indicator assigned to that strategy that will track whether it's successful, and a target set for the indicator, which represents when the goal will be achieved, when we'll know that the goal is achieved, and then a timeline for how, how soon we think we can get to that target. Now checking back on targets each year, let's say, is a great way to find out if they're actually being achieved or if they're being exceeded or if we're not achieving them. Maybe we need to rethink our strategies. So in this example, I've given you a couple different types of indicators. Um, quantitative indicators, so uh, acres being managed with best management practices for stormwater management, um, you know, concentrations of nutrients in, in streams, and then qualitative indicators like implementation of a program, whether or not it's in place. We also can look at things like relative targets, so percent increase, so change over time, um, as opposed to absolute targets of what we know we want to achieve a certain amount, uh, a certain number of acres, let's say. And this little uh, graphic in the bottom left here is an example of setting a target and comparing it to actual ridership and then ultimately um, seeing, you may see an increase beyond your target over time. So I'm going to add to the list of uh, areas we recommend you measure for your community's environmental, economic, health, and equity. Um, I'll explain for each area I cover here what to measure, how to measure, and why you should care. <laughs> so we'll start with water resources. As we all know, water is essential for life. Um, clean water resources are really a foundational part of your community's well-being and your long-term vitality and quality of life because it's not only 
water resources that serve as your community's water source, but also the quality of downstream waters can affect recreation opportunities and health in your region, which can affect economic development in the area and possible liabilities. We're increasingly aware of impacts of stormwater and the risks of flooding that destroy property, so there are lots of actions that communities are taking to try to address these issues. So we start with thinking about actions um, around stormwater, around um, impermeable surfaces, and linking them with what I would call here outcome indicators. So this pair of outcome indicators are really around, you know, have we protected water resources? The first one is, what are the percentage of fishable and swimmable lakes and river miles in your community? So we'd be looking for an increase, uh, or at least maintenance of, the percentage of uh, fishable and swimmable water bodies. And for those that aren't familiar, the, these definitions are, are designated uses set by EPA for water bodies that then indicate what the water quality needs to be to be fishable and swimmable, safe and healthy. Um, and data is collected about this every uh, two years at least in each region um, under the EPA's guidance under the Clean Water Act. So you can get that information. Um, we're looking, of course, about the impact of combined sewers, um, fecal bacteria, toxic stormwater pollution, um, and, and looking at those numbers, you can find them out from um, those you know, federal sources every couple of years, or there are things you can look at yourself. Um, there are actually ways to collect water samples in your community, and the way I would recommend doing that is that you collect um, samples at the, at the sort of upstream, at a medium point, and an, and an outflow in your community and really just to determine if the stream quality is improving as it flows through your community or not. Now we're looking maybe not only for drinking water standards or fishable um, and swimmable health standards, but you know if you're really looking at environmental sustainability, you should be looking at the whole ecosystem. Birds, mammals, um, they depend on healthy streams that support insects, fish, and plants. And so there are ecological thresholds that you would be looking for if you really want to support an aquatic ecosystem that goes through or comes out of your community. So you would be looking at things like nitrogen and phosphorus levels um, and using ecological thresholds to determine uh, whether or not your community is achieving those standards. There is data available on that that can be collected by perhaps watershed groups within your community, um, or there are ways to collect it yourself. Uh, there are low-cost sampling methods that uh, we can point you to if you need. So those are those outcomes we're hoping to achieve and how you might measure some of those. But, but those are sort of the long-term you know, impacts that you're looking for. Now, if you're thinking in the shorter term, you know, you're going to think about ways you can quickly make a change to improve water quality or protect water quality in your community. Um, for those of you that are familiar with TMDL plans, looking for areas of needed action. And so as you implement changes, tracking that they're implemented over time and quantifying those activities will really help you see if you're going in the right direction, if you're likely to have an impact on water quality in the long term. So things like um, you know, whether or not people are reached with a stormwater education program, um, going into numbers like acres managed with best management practices, um, so shorelines measured with, sh shorelines managed with uh, vegetative buffers on city and private property. The percentage of shoreline can be calculated through um, a physical survey. Um, some of the things like impervious cover can be calculated using national land cover data. Um, actually, if anybody knows of other sources for some of these things, I, I encourage you to bring them up later uh, during the chat. So permeable um, surfaces can be implemented for new construction or maybe they're being retrofitted over time. And so you could be asking um, people that do retrofits to report on when they've installed permeable pavement um, as part of, for example, a, a green map. Um, so Riverside, California has created a green map where people can log on and report green projects they're doing around the city. And so the city can take uh, an impervious cover layer, the last uh, data set comes from 2011, so it's a little bit older, and then add in information that you know now about where people have installed permeable pavement and do a calculation of current impervious cover in your watershed. And then over time, setting targets for obviously maintaining or reducing uh, the percent of impervious cover.
Um, air quality has been touched on briefly. Uh, we talked about greenhouse gas emissions earlier. And the need to manage air quality um, is not only because of uh, you know, climate change and the issues of using limited fossil fuels, but because it affects our health. Um, it affects our economic development. It affects our you know, number of sick days and business investment in your community. So strategies you can use to increase tree canopy coverage um, are going to actually remove air pollution from the urban uh, ecosystem. Tree canopy can be estimated using visual estimations and using the Forest Service's iTree protocol. Um, or you can go back to that national land cover data set from 2011 to see where, uh, where that data was at five years ago. Um, there are some state or regional agencies that have done more updated land cover data, and you can look to them for getting the current tree canopy coverage within your community. Another area to look would be in um, looking at ridership in transit. So as um, alternative transportation systems are enhanced, incentives are provided, um, transit ridership is collected monthly by transit agencies, collected usually by, as trips, not as number of people. And then there's a calculation to um, convert the number of trips to people. So for example, most people take two trips per day if they're using public transportation to get to work. Um, you can also look at physical characteristics like uh, are transit stops located near activities, um, high use community buildings and shopping districts to identify the need for changes in your uh, lane use planning and development codes. And then when we start to think about what that results in, we're looking at hopefully reducing the number of vehicle miles per capita and um, improving air quality and, and being able to tell that because you know, there are fewer days this year where ozone levels were above healthy levels. The um, municipal fleets can look at percentage of vehicles that are using alternative fuels and can compare gallons of fuel used across the city um, over the number of vehicles to look to make sure you're increasing efficiency in your city fleet over time. Um, you really want to find out also where your community compares. So as Wayne was describing, you know, every community is not going to have the same um, achievable levels of, of these indicators. And it's also important to know what trends are over time across the nation. So for example, um, vehicle miles traveled did go down uh, a lot of the last decade and then has been going up in last year, in the last few years. So it would be good to know if your community tracks that uh, trend, or if maybe you're doing even better, if maybe your community is continuing to um, have fewer vehicles miles traveled. I'm going to jump past waste here because I think, um, as George pointed out, we're doing pretty well on managing and measuring our waste. Um, I'm only just going to point out that I think every community should be trying to figure out its capture ratio. Um, what percent of recyclable and compostable material is diverted from trash. And you can get that from working with your waste provider or also from doing surveys, uh, waste audits within your community. I mentioned before the importance of green space for air quality, but um, there's other reasons to conserve green space. Uh, for example, for wildlife and our natural ecosystems. We share our developed landscapes with a lot of other species. Some of them have been affected by our activities and preserving habitat is essential to their survival. It's important that we conserve open space or wildlife habitat, but also that we keep patches of habitat connected to each other um, for movement to adapt to changing conditions and disturbances. So we can determine whether um, our green space is being protected by looking at things like corridors of natural habitat and fragmentation of those natural areas. The challenge here is that they're not some, um, they're not easily accessible indicators. These are still being developed in a lot of cases. But just looking at a map and getting a sense for whether or not your community is pretty well um, connected in terms of its, its natural areas. And, and there, this is starting to link with green infrastructure. Depending on how you define it, green infrastructure involves having these connected um, uh, corridors of, of wildlife habitat. And then if you want to look at outcomes from um, whether or not that's actually affecting wildlife, then we can be looking at uh, native plants coverage um, in the city. We can be looking at wildlife species that are observed. And particularly, um, wildlife species can be observed through a community education program, um, like a day or a week-long bio blitz, where you're getting wildlife lovers out to observe and identify and count wildlife in your community. 
The last one I want to touch on is um, around active living and the connections between our green spaces, our health, and our recreation opportunities. So it's essential for maintaining uh, public health and, and outcomes that we could measure would be our um, local obesity rates, which can be found at their metropolitan statistical area um, or county level usually. But ways we get there include increasing the number of um, residents that are within half a mile are able to get to parks and green space. And so this is an example um, map from a community where they actually mapped out all their parks and then did a GIS analysis of a half mile buffer, which if you're even a GIS kind of novice is pretty easy to do. And then found out, um, in this case, you know, 97% of, 98% of their residents are within a half a mile of parks. And you can look at this spatially and say who, which neighborhoods and, and who particularly in this community does not have access. And that gets into those equity questions. of How can we make sure that not only are we um, reducing, let's say, you know, obesity and increasing activity in the community, but we're also ensuring that everyone in the community is benefiting from those efforts. And so maybe that means we need to look back at our parks plan and ensure that we're providing um, um, consistent, equitable access to our parks for everyone. So once um, you've selected and measured indicators, then what? So how do you use these metrics? Um, when you measure indicators, I think you want to start with a baseline. So find historical or current data for now as a baseline. And then as you begin to implement programs, you need to check back in regularly, annually at least, to see how they're changing as you do implementation. The data you collect is useful for planning and budgeting and to help tell your story. So new residents, if you put this information out, you can interest them in the programs and the things that you're achieving and get them excited about moving to your town. Um, when you have new staff or new council members, letting them know what you've been doing and why it's important, it really helps to reach that broader audience. And that's the ultimate goal, right? We're going to learn together about what works and what doesn't, and we're going to work to ensure we and future generations can live on the earth in harmony. So that's my piece. If there are indicators you're trying to measure or interested in collecting, um, please bring them up in the Q&A. I know we covered a few things pretty quickly. Um, and I'll hand it off to Kim for now. Um, those of you that are in the Northeast, I invite you to join the Sustainability Network. And you can contact me for details about that. Great. Thank you, Joanna. Um, so just to kind of wrap our presentations here, I did mention at the intro that um, this session was very timely. And essentially what I was referring to there is just the fact that we've seen a real shift over the last three to five years in how local governments are delivering their services with a more citizen-centric approach. Uh, essentially, we are trying to be more transparent with our community members about how we operate. We're holding ourselves accountable for funds, resources spent on programs, policies, etc. All of this ultimately aiming to create pathways to citizen participation. And that is so essential when we're talking about sustainability. Because if we're trying to create a sustainable community, the governments we know can't do it alone. You have to engage your businesses, institutions, and individuals. And you need to help them think about how to change their behavior. You can't make them change their behavior. But you can create enabling environments and educate them so that they are able to change their behavior. Um, you know, and a lot of the work that a lot of you are doing, and that was exemplified in the examples, uh, particularly from Wayne, of creating those enabling environments, walkable neighborhoods, public transit, things of that sort. You're leading by example in your operations. Those are the steps in the right direction. But you need to make sure you're communicating the successes of those programs to your community members. And a publicly facing sustainability dashboard is one way. Um, in a way that a number of local governments have been using to communicate these sustainability metrics. And so, in, in generally how they're reaching their goals through them. So just, I want to leave you all with kind of three key tips here when you're thinking about communicating sustainability metrics to your community members. Um, first off, know your audience. You know your local government, uh, excuse me, your community members. In the U.S., 50% of adults can't read a book at an eighth grade level. You need to be thinking about that. Don't just throw a bunch of data on a website and say we're being transparent, because that's not the case. You need to make sure that you're explaining to folks why this matters. And I think Wayne did a good job of think, talking about how they made that transition to, to that. And then and this leads to the next thing, measure what matters. There's a lot of data out there, but some of it isn't really giving you any information. Make sure you're focusing on the data that's telling the story of how your community is heading down that path towards sustainability. And then finally, when you're thinking about a dashboard, 
you really want to make sure you're explaining why we care about these indicators and metrics, be sure to include dynamic content because a lot of these outcomes, we're lucky if we have that information updated once a year. And then finally, if you're getting folks to come to a website, you want to make sure you're incorporating calls to action so you're actually, you get them excited like, hey, here's why we care about this metric and here's where we're at right now, here are the goals we set, we want to get there. Don't just leave them hanging. Take that step and say, here's how you can be part of the solution. Uh, so you're going to want to make sure you find a tool that can do just that. Um, well, I think with that, I want to make sure we have time for the q and I wanted to thank all of our panelists for some great presentations. And uh, Ben, do you want to start with the question? Sure. Uh, and we do have a, a couple of questions. And I encourage uh, participants uh, in this webinar to uh, put their own questions in the, the question bar on the uh, webinar toolbar on the right side of your screen. But I, I guess I, I'd like to start with my own question. Um, I, um, and let me preface this by saying I, I work for uh, in New Hampshire for the state housing finance agency and we administer the low income housing tax credit on behalf of the Treasury Department, which you know is it's finances uh, housing construction, low income housing construction. And it is a score based approach. And through the years we've tried to induce smart growth through how we allocate the tax credits, and that's that's proven to be a difficult thing for us to do. And in particular, and this, and something that that Wayne said when he was making his presentation made me think of this. He talked about infill, and you know what is, but but if we if we if infill is important, then we've got to implement it somehow. Um, so we wanted to see uh, projects that are infill projects, uh, but we've had difficulty defining what that means. Um, so more recently, and for the past couple of years, we've looked at things like walk score, um, and that we got some pushback from that because it works pretty well in urban areas, but not so well in rural areas. So we we found that our state Department of Environmental Services actually had created this data set called Community Center Areas, which were locally derived um, data sets available online that defined a specific area in each community that, that um, was regarded as the community center. And it was fairly broadly construed. So we actually adopted that. Um, and so my, my question for you is, uh, is it better or, or better or worse, or what are the relative benefits or drawbacks of using broadly scale, broad scale, widely accepted measures like walk score versus locally derived measures that have uh, some local input. And this is for any of the panelists. This is Wayne. I guess I'd start by saying it, it depends. Either one could be fine. You know, I mean, I think it, the, the broad scores to me, I think, are often better at telling a story. You know, walk score most people have heard about, and, and so I think it's really good for telling a story. But it misses an awful lot of local conditions. The local stuff, I think, is great when you have the time to do a right. So I don't, I don't know how New, New Hampshire came up with it, their numbers. But if it's really based on assessment of what's here, things that might be missing from walk score, I think it's great. But just, it, it, it's not easier. It's probably a much harder way to do it. Yeah, I would just um, echo that, that it comes down to time and money. I mean, the beauty of a walk score is it's done for you, but it's much less accurate. But at the but it might be all you can get if you don't have the money and time to do it right. I was just yeah, going to comment. Kim, I agree with that. Go ahead, Kim. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say I agree with that. And for folks that are just trying to get started, I mean, let's be honest. The majority of local governments in the U.S. do not have a sustainability director. They don't necessarily have funds to do a planning process. I think for those that just want to get started and not use those previous reasons as an excuse not to do anything, Walk score is great. It's a great starting point. It gives you some kind of picture. It might not be perfect, but nothing is. Those are great answers. I, I was just going to add, this is Joanna, I was just going to add that if what you're looking for is that you're trying to increase infill, you're trying to change the either the density or the number of vacant lots um, within a certain distance from the center of your community, that that kind of um, Analysis is sort of a back to that proximate indicator of have you changed, have you um, converted vacant lots into development? Have you increased density? Um, and you know that that's an analysis that presumably you could do in house, um, but is is really getting at that deeper issue of what you're trying to achieve and how you're trying to achieve it. Um, whereas walk score has you know sort of a, a bunch of different implications that aren't exactly tied to that question. 
Great, thank you. So we have a, a taking up Joanna's invitation to uh, provide in, some information on other indicators. Uh, we have we do have a comment here uh, that is some Maryland counties use the acreage of farmland preserved as one of the indicators. Urban green space created or preserved is another indicator that those counties use as well. I think this was actually used by the Sustainable Communities Initiative um, in the Obama administration, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, that's a great one. So we have a, a question, and I think this is for Jim. Um, how can the registry or other software help energy utilities partner with water utilities to work together to reduce energy consumption? Um, this is a uh, yeah. This is Jim here. Um, well, I think there's a lot of different ways that the water utilities and 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 the energy utilities can collaborate. Clearly, the uh, the water utilities are using a significant amount of energy. So it may be possible through a registry to start publishing data to communities about the energy consumption by water utilities and have them work together you know, through uh, intelligence gathering to design strategies to, and to track and, and monitor progress to reducing them. I mean, clearly, uh, water is a, an intensive energy uh, enterprise. So I think that there certainly should be ways to collaborate. OK, we have a. Um uh, question here. I'm interested in hearing the panelists' economic considerations, that is, return on investment and evaluation process of the sustainability policy discussion slash implementation. So what, can you talk about uh, return on investment? Um, I'd be happy to you actually skipped over a slide that for interest of time about economic development outcomes from sustainability programs. Um, a couple of the metrics that our communities have tracked have been um, if you're increasing, let's say, investment and uh, maybe access to particular natural amenities or cultural amenities in a certain, like in a downtown area, um, asking your local businesses to track uh, their profits over time and see if you get, if they're getting an increase over time with increased traffic. Um, is one thing that our communities have done. Um, you can also just go more broadly to changes in, you know, home values over time are expected to go up in a community that is um, reinvesting in its, you know, more sustainable attributes in its natural settings and its local amenities, increasing its, you know, livability and walkability um, is expected to see home prices go up. So those are a couple of the ones that we often point to. Okay. Um, Sorry, and I'll just add that um, we have to be very, I mean, the problem with a lot of the new public management movement in the local governments is that we do often get fixated on things that we can measure, and a lot of sustainability doesn't enter into that system just yet. And so we need to be very cognizant that we aren't going to necessarily be able to put a dollar value, especially when we get into, you know, the broader economic, com environmental commons or issues of social equity. Um, and so I just put that out there as a, a, a bit of a, you know, keep that in your mind. And I, I, I think that's a great point. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jimena. I was just going to say, I assume that everybody's thinking, you know, it's sort of an obvious answer would be no, uh, dollars saved on fuel, dollars saved on water, dollars saved on energy um, as local governments make changes internally and then as, you know, the community as a whole makes changes. So those, those are, I'm hoping, go without saying. <laughs> Um, this is Kim. I just wanted to add for those of you that aren't familiar with the sustainable return on investment uh, process, it was designed by economists and essentially it monetizes the social and environmental impacts and benefits of various projects in your community. Um, mostly infrastructure projects, but they, they are looking at, um, you know, you could look at green infrastructure or stormwater management. Um, sustainable buildings, things like that. So it helps you, for example, if you wanted to, you know, have a lead building, um, it, it helps you kind of monetize what those benefits are so that you can look at the comparisons of the, the savings and the cost on a financial level. So you're basically comparing apples to apples rather than just saying, oh, that building's going to be more expensive than just traditionally building it. And I mention it because there's a tool out by Impact Infrastructure that has these different modules. The process can do any type of project, but they're adding modules into this easy-to-use tool. My team uses it a lot. Um, and for sure, there will be more um, categories coming up in future months. OK, we are. Um, I, so Kim, um, we have a question. Where can I find the sustainable LOA? Uh, 
Oh, it's ROA. R yeah, there's a typo there. ROA. What, where, where can where can folks find the sustainable ROA? Do we lose Kim? <laughs> Does anyone else know? Yeah, I think we lost Kim. Okay, we can follow up with the question um, offline. All right, um, I'm back. Okay. I hung up. <laughs> <laughs> I just made such a good point, I just wanted to hang up. <laughs> so, Kim, the question was, where do you find that tool? Uh, Impact Infrastructure is the organization. Um, also, um, you know, my I have the tool as well, so people, my email's right up there, so I can uh, give folks access to it. Okay, great. Or not access, but I can talk to you about it. And finally, this this will be the last question out of the interest of time. Uh, could Wayne or Kim talk a little about about the, about the STAR community indicators? Sure, I can start. Um, so STAR is, is a grown program. I think 40 some odd communities have gone through the process now. It's specifically aimed at North American cities, United States and Canada. Um, and municipalities file this the, the goals and the goal areas I talked about, so there's goals and objectives and there's actions. So I think I the exact number, but it's in the hundredths of the number of, of things you're measuring. And so you're doing everything from talking about outcomes, you know, what percentage of your workforce is commuting to work by foot or, or by transit or by single occupancy vehicle. Um, and so there's sort of snapshots in ta ta time, where are you right now? And then the part that's more interesting for a lot of communities who are, who are moving forward is, and what are your actions? Do you have a policy to create, use an example from the question, affordable housing and walking distance of your city core area? You know, what is your walk score area within certain areas of town? And so you just go through these measures. The number is big in terms of the number of metrics you have to report on, but a lot are very easy, you know, sources that are easy to find. Um, and there's a very clear, transparent scoring system, so you get a good sense of how you're going to be scored you submit it to STAR, they're doing assessments, so there's a third party review. Um, and then you get a score. And, and so on the surface, it's really just about a rating system to see how your community compares to other communities and, and to this ideal score. But I think equally important for a lot of communities is just you have this framework you can think about. So we have, for example, a sustainable plan, which we think is a great plan but we think the metrics in it, frankly, are pretty lousy. And so we're planning to use the STAR metrics when we revise our plan in a year from now to sort of replace the metrics that are there. I know some communities are thinking about actually doing their broad goal area to match STAR. So it's, it's a way of looking at sustainability comprehensively. Yeah, I would only add that, you know, I think it's, I think STAR is a great framework. Um, I do know a lot of uh, communities and I have worked with clients that are doing exactly what Wayne said. You know, they're using that STAR framework for their comp plans, for their sustainability plans, and whatnot. Um, I, I think the biggest thing here is it's great if you have the resources to go through that process. I encourage it. It's a lot of work. There are definitely so many benefits, um, but it's it's not feasible for everyone. But again, don't use that as an excuse not to do it. I think you can easily use that framework as a starting point incorporated into your planning processes or just into helping identify what that foundation is of your sustainability work, looking at maybe some of the key metrics that you have readily available. I think it's, it's a, there's a lot to digest there, but it's also very concrete and it was developed over years by experts in this area. So it's, it's definitely a fantastic and very valuable tool. And we'll let that be the last word as we are now a few minutes over time. I want to thank our uh, panelists for today's great discussion on sustainability. And folks, you remember to tune in next week for another great webcast on hazard mitigation. Thanks very much.